Thank you very much for the opportunity you have given me to make this presentation. Uh, it's all about the evaluation of the radioprotective properties of Okuma Longa extract on biomechanical changes in irradiated brain cells. So I was heavily supervised by my main supervisor, that is um, Professor Balogo, is in physics, also in Center for Energy here where I'm currently staying. And also I have another supervisor from biochemistry. And because the work was actually done in South Africa and Nigeria here. So Dr. Francis was able to supervise the work at VET. And she was then at the radiation sciences, which was under, which is under the faculty of health sciences at VET University in South Africa. So the outline of my presentation is this. I will give you a brief introduction about myself and then my connection to ASP. Then after that, I will give an overview of my PhD research work, which will start from the background to the study. Then I will explain the statement of the research problem. And after that, I will be talking about the aim and the objectives of my research. Then I will summarize the methods that I used. Then I will also give you the presentation of the results that I've seen so far. Then my future plans concerning this study. <clears throat> so from what you can see there, the presenter, the journey so far, I was actually trying to make my presentation and I saw this picture. I was like, hey, that was when I started the science, just before I started the science journey. That was my junior secondary school days during that. Coyote, we cannot hear you anymore. Uh, Kayude, can you hear me? Can anybody hear me? Yeah, yeah. we hear you. Can, yeah. Okay, he seemed to have dropped out. So let's let's wait for him to come back. Hi, Kayude, are Hello? you? Yes? Yes, I'm very sorry. They just, um, there was power outage, so I had to switch to another source here. No problem. Yeah. So from what I was saying earlier on, I... I Do you want to go to full screen mode? Okay, sorry. Yes. 
So this was when I actually started, before I started my science journey, it was very nice though. But I, like I said earlier on, when I saw the picture, I was like, oh, let me share this. It, at least it will give me some form of memory of where the whole thing actually started. During my secondary school days, that was when we were actually introduced to physics and then I actually wanted to do medicine, which is actually the plan of most physics students here in Nigeria. We wanted to do medicine, but because our grades were not up to what we want, up to what they wanted, so they had to give us another course of study, which was when I was given physics. And the picture here, that was when I was matriculated in to the university. That was several years ago and this picture here that was the day i defended what we normally call my projects my undergraduate project then so after my bachelor of technology program i enrolled into medical physics program which was actually done at obafemi awolowo university here in nigeria so I looked through all the programs they have. Since I couldn't make medicine, I was like, okay, what other alternative can I have so that I'll be able to apply my physics to solve human problems, especially when it comes to medical needs. So that was when I enrolled into medical physics program and it was very interesting. So the picture here, at the bottom left here, that was just about 30 or 35 minutes, if I could remember very well, before I defended my MSc thesis. So, and after, during my MSc program, I actually realized there are some gaps that actually could be filled. So that was when I decided to proceed for my PhD. picture on this bottom right here that was also before I defended the PAD thesis which was actually done on the March 2nd that was this year actually I should have done it last year but because of COVID and other issues it was postponed till around March this year and right now I'm almost done with the administrative aspect which is the last part of the whole program. So my connection to ASP, I saw the application information online. I think it was about three or four days before the deadline. Then I ran to my supervisor, okay, write me a recommendation letter. I'm going to apply for this. And fortunately for me, I was chosen and that was 2016 Kigali. And the picture right here, that was when we arrived at the International Airport and we were received by the hotel guys here. And the picture on the right here, that was one of, during one of our seminars that was held, I think this was the first day, the end of the first lecture when we were returning back home. And the picture I have here, I, I have other, other members with Professor John Hellis also during our discussion day. And for the ASP, I, Dr. Esmeralda Itaden was assigned majorly to mentor me and it was very fruitful. She gave me a lot of advice and then I was also able to use them during my PhD program and my appreciation goes to her. And if I move on, I have this, which is an overview of my PhD research work. I'm going to give an explanation on what I did. I actually made it to be very brief so that I will have enough time to have to answer questions about the research work. So the background to the study is like from the topic that I gave earlier on, it centers about the radiation of brain cells. And when we look at it very well, we see that brain cells actually, brain actually coordinates the activities of the body. It controls the organs, the way they connect together. And then for us to function properly, we actually need the cells of the brain to function optimally. 
And if there is any problem with the brain cells, that means the whole body system is going to have a problem. And fortunately, the introduction of physics to medicine has been a long, has been since a long period of time. And then one of the application actually centers around radiation use. And for radiation, we have different types, depending on actually what you want to describe. If you want to describe radiation in terms of the energy, you'll be talking about the energy, especially when they are able to ionize or uh, they are unable to do so. That is when you'll be dealing with non-ionizing and ionizing radiation. In terms of other issues also, maybe electromagnetic radiation or particle radiation. But for this study, I actually use a, an ionizing source, which is actually a cobalt-60 source. And generally today, we have, we have seen a lot of application of radiation in medicine, especially for imaging purposes. We have also for therapeutic purposes. And also we have the use of radiation, which if you can't cure a disease, especially cancer, you can also use them as a palliative measure. And all this also can be applied for imaging, imaging the brain, radiotherapy of the brain, and also for patients that have brain tumor. And for all these applications, we have been made to understand that there are so many detriments attached to it, especially at the tissue level, the molecular level, and also the biochemical changes that, are also, that have been implicated through all this. For the molecular level, we have the chromosomal aberration and the DNA breaks, which is actually a major problem because if a cell that as a DNA as a problem, definitely there will be a major issue with the whole body system, <clears throat> excuse me. So, but fortunately we have some local practices and even some international report that there is this extract, which scientifically is called the Kokuma Longa extract and the general, the English general name for it is turmeric that it acts antioxidant properties. And fortunately, this antioxidant property can be used to assess the ability to ameliorate some of the detriments of radiation. As I will show you earlier on, radiation actually can dam cause damages through different modes. But unfortunately for us in physics, most of these radiation effects have been biochemical in nature. Even the normal radiobiology we do is basically biology, biology, biology. So my research problem was just to look at which other area can physics come in and then that can actually augment what this biology is all about. So this chart actually shows the radiation damage pathway for an ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation can actually have a direct effect or an indirect effect. Direct effect is when it affects the DNA strand directly, but for the indirect effect, it will actually attach to the water contents of the cell, which actually contains about, the cell contains about 70% of water. So once that interacts with the water content, it can cause excitation and eventually ionize the water molecules there. And then these ions will be formed. And these ions that are formed are oxidative radicals. And when these attach to the DNA or the RNA, they will cause damages. And naturally, the DNA has its own way of repairing. If it repairs correctly, the cell may actually survive. And if it does not, if the cell does not repair, the cell is actually going to die. And the repair mechanism also can be in two ways. The cell that survived the repair can actually turn back to the normal cell, the original DNA. And if there is a mutation in the DNA, that can actually result into what we call 
cancer, and that can be an induction or the beginning of carcinogenesis. And generally, ionizing radiation damage can be divided into the physical stage, the pre-chemical stage, and then we have the chemical stage also before the biological effects can be seen, which can actually be from minutes, and then it can occur in years, and the years can also be genetic in nature because the DNA is actually affected. So for all these damages, actually, the cell is complex in nature. It has a lot of inherent properties. But in medical practice today, we focus more on the biology aspect. So that is why this research came in and said, OK, what other property, inherent property of the cell can we look into and can be beneficial to medicine? Also, there, so that was mechanical aspects of the cell. And when we looked at the literature, we actually realized that this has been used also at the tissue level, especially when you want to examine boil in human beings. You look at how the texture of the skin surface, you can actually use that to indicate some problems that are affecting the tissue, but unfortunately, like I said earlier on, there are limited information about the inherent properties of the cell when it comes to physics aspects of this. But the only closest part to this is um, the electromagnetic property of the cell, but we are unable to assess the mechanical aspect for us to be able to understand the movements of the cell in order to assess the health status at the cellular level. And also this can also help us to support the radiobiological models that are accepted in clinical practice for the management of cancer cells today. So the statement of the research problem, like I have said earlier on, is that the use of radiation for imaging the brain has been on the increase, especially in Africa because we now have the introduction of the linear accelerator and then most clinics are coming up with these ideas. And the detriment, like I explained, have been biochemical in nature over the, de over the decades. Whenever a radiation affects a cell or tissue, the explanation you get from that have been biochemical in nature. And then the major explanation have been centered around the oxidative stress that are generated from radiation, especially the electromagnetic ones. So actually, we from all this, we need requisite information on the effects of locally produced scavengers that can actually reduce this, that can actually reduce this detriment and give us the biomechanical properties when you expose cells to radiation, especially the brain cells. So the aim, like I said, is that we actually investigated the radioprotective potential of the Kokuma Lunga, which is actually the turmeric extract, using um, gamma radiation-induced changes in different types of brain cells. And then we actually used normal brain cells, and we used the cancer brain cells. And then we did this using biochemical techniques. And the two major techniques we use were the cell viability study and then the reactive oxygen species assays. And then after that, we looked at the stiffness characterization of established brain cells. So this is how we, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, we evaluated the, we carried out some evaluation of the free radical scavenging activities of the C extract. We did that in vitro. Then after that, we looked at the viability of the cells in the presence and absence of the extracts, especially when we expose them to radiation. Then after that, we examined the amounts or the level of the reactive oxygen species that were produced after radiation exposure in the presence and absence of the extract. <clears throat> then after that, we did some indentation experiments 
by examining the stiffness of the brain cells. So these are a few of the materials that are used. So this is the extract that was used. And these are a few of the other materials. We used a cobalt 60 source, which was at the Charlotte Maxeke Johannesburg Academic Hospital. So we used a plate reader, and then also we used a flow cytometer to assess our hard OS. So this is the CO2 incubator we use to grow to grow the cells. And this is our microscope that we use regularly to see the status of the cell. So like I said earlier on, I, you, we used two brain cells. This, uh, the brain cell we used was the normal cell line and then the U87, which is the Uppsala 87 malignant, malignant glioma cell. So this actually represented the cancer cell line. So this, we use the VICO 3100D AFM to do the indentation experiment. So the vectors that were that was used, I have actually summarized that into the extract production. Then Are you the, the, sir? Um, on the could you go back to the previous slide? Could you explain what the AFM is? Yes, I will explain that during the course of the lecture. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah. So the extract production is there. We did an in vitro study. Then after that, we carried out the viability assay after radiation exposure. Then the fluorescence measurements was to understand the level of the reactive oxygen species, which is an indication of the radiation damage. Then after that, we used the AFM to do the indentation experiment. So what we did was we obtained the extract, uh, we obtained the plant material, then after that we sun dried it and then grinded about a few kg of the turmeric that I showed earlier on, which is, which is this. And then after that, we're able to get about 250 grams of the dry okay. extract. I hope I'm not going too fast, please. Hello? It's fine, please go continue. Okay, because I'm actually using only my battery here. So then after that, we had that about 500 mils of ionized, of distilled water to that. Then we had that two liters of methanol. Then after that, we did a maceration just to shake the extract to shake the contents, the whole of this for about 24 hours. Then after that, we did a filtration using a cutting plug. After that, we filtered using a number one filter paper. Then that was how we were able to get our crude extracts. Then after this, we concentrated using the rotary evaporator at about 40 degrees Celsius, then we dried it. After this, we, we stored the extracts under a temperature of four degrees Celsius until our further use. So the, like I said earlier on, <clears throat> sorry, the in vitro assay, so one of that is this, we did the DPPH, which is the ability of the extract to reduce this radical. This is a free radical. So what we did was just to add about one mil of the extracts to, about one mil of 0 0.3 millimolar of the DPPH. And then this was actually constituted in methanol. So we mixed this and then incubated in, <clears throat> sorry, incubated this for about 30 minutes. This is just a summary of the whole experiment. So the full details is actually in my thesis. So again, we looked at the hydroxyl radical scavenging assay. So one mil of the reagent was added to one mil of the extracts. Although for each mil of the extracts, we used different concentration as you will see in the result. So that was also incubated at a, at a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius for about one hour. And then we added about well, one mil of two barbituric acid and one mil of the TCA. Then we heated the whole mix mixture in a boiling water for about 
20 minutes. Then we used a plate reader for the measurements at this particular wavelength. So also the ferric reducing antioxidant property was carried out. So we added one mil of the working reagent to so about one mil of the extract also. Then we incubated for about 10 minutes. After this, we read at an absorbance of 593 nanometer wavelength. So the, this <clears throat> is where the radiation actually came in. So what we did was we, after, the, after this whole experiment, we went further to examine the effects on the cells. So we grew the cells inside a T75 flask. So when, it was, when this flask was about 70% filled up, we actually seeded the cells inside the 96 well place. So I just used this, all of this chart as a flow for how the experiment was carried out. So after 70% 70, 70 of this was filled up, we plated the cells inside this 96 well plate. Then after 24 hours, we added different concentrations of the extract. And you can see that from what we have there. Then after 24 hours, we exposed the cells to radiation. And this is just a simple, description of how we arrange this. This is a cobalt 60 source. So we used this phantom to prevent bar scattering. Also, we added, this is the plate we used. So from the radiation source here to where the cells are, that was about 80 centimeters. And the thickness of the plate is about 0 0.012 meters. So after the exposure to the gamma source, we now did the MTT assay in order to examine the viability of the cell. So the MTT assay is just, we had 10 microliters of the reagent. The reagent we used was a ready to make, ready to use one. So we had that about 10 microliters into each of this well. So after four hours, we were able to see that the cells absorbed the reagent. Then about after the four hours, we added about, we added the detergent, which is for, which is meant to allow the cells to bring out all what they have absorbed at this stage. So this was what we were able to get from that. Then after that, we read the absorbance of this at, a wavelength of 450 nanometers. So that was how the whole experiment for this was carried out. And before I proceed further, the tooth cells that we used, that were used, like I said earlier, on the U87 MG cells, which stands for the cancer cells, were grown inside the Dubeco modified goose medium. Then we added the FBS. Then in order to avoid uh, contamination, we added about 1% of pen strip. So the only difference between the growth medium for the cancer cells and the normal cells that we used are just the basic medium. While this used the DMEM, this used the RPM, which is the Rosewell Park Memorial Institute, I think 1640 about that. So we used this medium for the rest of the experiment. So for the IRS measurements, which is, which actually followed similar results to what we have here. So the fluorescence is actually a function of the amount of IRS that was produced. Like we also did for the viability assay, we make sure that 70% of this flask is filled with the respective cell that we used. Then after that, we added the cells to this 96 well plate. Some we use 96 well plates. For some, we use a six well plate, but this is just a representation, the flow of how the experiment was carried out. Then after 24 hours, we added the extracts again. Then we now return them back to the CO2 incubator. Then after 24 hours, we expose them to radiation just as we did under the viability experiment. 
Then after that, we did the HAROS assay, which is simply adding 100 microliters of the dye that we used. I think that should be somewhere around here. We used a DC, the RS measurement, we used a DC FDA dye. So we reconstituted that actually in methanol also. So we now added 100 microliters of the working solution into each of these wells. So after that, we incubated the cells for about 45 minutes. Then we read them using a floor, uh, either we use a flow cytometer or we also use a plate reader, which actually measures fluorescence. Unlike the variability assay, assay measures the absorbance, while for the ROS measurements, we measured the fluorescence in the cells. So this is where the atomic force microscope actually comes in. So this is the flow chart that I use for that, that we use for that also. We grew the cell inside this same plate. Then after about 70% confluence, like we've been doing, we grew the cell inside a six well plate. So inside each of this well, we have a 22 millimeters glass cover slip so that the cells can actually be grown on that. And then the measurements was actually taken in air within the shortest possible time because the AFM we used was actually meant for a material science research work. I only adapted it for a biophysics research work. So the measurements were taken in here and it was done within the shortest possible time. So the cover slips were kept in the growth medium until measurement time. And also for getting the images in this experiment, we used a tapping mode. So the parameters were actually adjusted until we were able to get a meaningful, until we were able to get meaningful results. So like I have here, then after 24 hours, I added the extracts. After 24 hours again, I exposed them to radiation like I have here in order to follow the same trend. So after 24 hours of radiation exposure, I removed the cover slip and then placed them under the AFM for measurement. So this is the, we have different models for, that are applied in AFM indentation, but for this experiment, I use the Earth's model, model rather. So this is the AFM I used. So the next slide is going to give you a brief summary of what, how the AFM actually works. So this is how the physics of the AFM. The AFM actually has a cantilever. This is a cantilever. There is a photodiode. This is, sorry, this is a photodiode. And there is a laser beam that is incident on this cantilever that we have here. Once this is incident on it, it will be reflected back to a four quadrant photodiode. And this is how the whole stuff works. This cantilever is meant to move up and down, up and down, very close. Once it is coming down, it moves very close to the sample. And there is going to be some form of Van der Waal force between the tip that you have here, which is placed under the cantilever. And once the tip moves close to the sample here, there it will move until it gets to a repulsive region. And when there is a repulsion between this tip that we have here and the sample, and in my case, I used cell, there will be a retraction of this cantilever. And as this cantilever has been moved, closer to the sample and back, there will be a deflection of this again. And as this beam is being reflected back to this photodiode, it will be reflected at different points on this photodiode that we have here, which is an indication of the stiffness of the cell that we have here. And like I said earlier on, this is just a flow. Naturally, what we measure is the deflection. 
and the distance between the tip and the sample that we have here. But after processing of the result, we're going to have indentation of the sample. And like I said, it is indentation of the cells that I used for my experiment. And then this is just a brief summary of what we did. So the whole experiment is going to be based on the first distance curve, which we are quite, which is going to be processed from the simple analogy that I have here. So we're now going to, we plotted a curve of the indentation force here against this X model that we have here. So this is going to be the force of interaction between the tip sample that we have here and the brain cells that I use for the experiment. And also this is going to be the amount of indentation that is going to occur at this part. This actually bulb here represents, <coughs> sorry, represents the cells that I used for this experiment. So this is just a very summary of how the AFM actually works. So what we actually uh, measure- Could you yeah? go back to that uh, slide a little bit and- Okay. Um, could you explain this graph again and which the various, uh, I think these are distances, DC and yes. D and Z and, you know, uh, explain to us what are all of these parameters and how do they go into the model? So this is when, this is the cantilever natural position, equilibrium position before it starts the indentation experiment. So the Z actually represents the distance from the tip of the cantilever tip up to the substrate that you have here. And once the cantilever starts to move very close to the sample, that is actually what we have as our D here, which is going to be the distance between the tip here and the top of the sample that we have. And then the cantilever deflection, which is the amount of the movements of the cantilever that you have from here, from the natural position, from the equilibrium position to the deflection position that we have here. So the sample indentation is what we have here, which is the amount of the indentation, the tip that we have here moves into this sample. So once we, the R that we have here is just the radius of this tip that we have here. So this V is actually the Poisson function, which naturally for whole cells, we take that to be about 0 0.5. Naturally, that is what we use for cell. So this is the indentation within that I represented by these D heads that we have here. And the, the, can, the cantilever uh, movement is angular rotation is not just translation up and down. Is that correct? Yes. Once it is, it contains both of them. Once it moves very close to the sample, it is going to form a slight angular movement, which is when the deflection, it is going to deflect. And once that deflect, that is why we have it forming different positions, reflected beam on this photodiode here. So once this is deflected, eh, sorry, once this is deflected, it's, some it may, it may come here, it will move to this side, but for it to be deflected, it has to move very close to the sample that we have here. So it combines the translational movement and then the angular movement together. So okay. that is, is that understood, please? Yes, thank you. So, so this is actually what I use for my experiment. So, like I said earlier on, we have a first distance measurement, which is what I have here, the interaction between the tip and the sample, and then the distance between this and what we have here. So we actually use a software to do all this processing that we have here. So this is the cantilever spring constant. So this is our Z that we have here, distance between the Z and here. And also this is going to be the distance for each of these points. That is where our Z in comes in. And then the force is for each of the points that we have here. 
So once we're able to form the whole of this, we'll be able to have our first then Z distance for the experiment. So a brief for the whole result, I've been able to summarize everything as much as possible into all these four slides that we have there. Like I said earlier on, we looked at the in vitro antioxidant assay, then the viability assay after radiation exposure. Then we looked at the fluorescence measurements, then the indentation curves, which I said earlier on that adjust the false distance curve, which, which are indication of the stiffness of the cells that we use for this study. So we, because we used different concentration of the extract, but we realized from what we have seen here, as the extra concentration increase, they are normally the cells we use for this study are adherent cell, which means as the cell grow, like I showed this to you earlier on, as the cell grows on this template that we have here, they will be attached to the substrate that we have there. But unfortunately, as the extra concentration increased, there will be detached, the cells get detached from that. So we're able to say, okay, let's look at all this, what should be good for all our experiments. We're able to stop at about 100 microgram per meal for the extra so that because once the cell gets detached, there was a very big problem for us to be able to do our indentation experiment because the cells must be attached to our, the cells must be attached to the cover slip that we used in order for us to have the successful indentation experiment. So that was why we decided to choose extra concentration between at a maximum of 100 microgram per meal. So this was for the bend endothelial cell, which we use for our normal cell. Also, we examined some form of irregularities also with the cancer cells also. Like I showed here, the safety profile of the extract after 24 hours. So this is a few results. I've summarized everything here. For the radi radical scavenging assays, we realized that increase in the concentration of the extract actually caused an increase in the ability of the cells to reduce the free radical. So the radical scavenging assays that we did here was without the cells. We only used some reagents to examine this. So we have this as the OH, also we have the ferric, the ability of the cells to, the ability of the extract to actually reduce the ferric ion. So for all the, for the three that I presented here, we realized that as the extract concentration increased, there was increase in the ability of the extract to inhibit the oxidative ability of the reagent that we used. So before we actually incubate the cells with the extracts, we look at the effect of radiation on the cell. So this is just a percentage of the honey radiated cell. So we assume that at zero gray, we have 100% of the cells that are present. So we normalize the rest of the radiation dose exposure to the zero grade that we have here. And from these two curves, we realized that the cancer cells were more resistant to radiation, especially as you can see here that we have here, the normal cells are actually more susceptible to radiation exposure. But as they get to the maximum eighth grade that we used here, they were almost moving towards the same points here because more of the normal cells actually died. And for the cancer cells that we have here, we still have more of them who are still able to survive, especially at the sixth grade. But when they got to about eighth grade, we realized the two of them were moving towards the same direction. And that is why 
sometimes in clinics today, they always encourage higher dose for killing this particular cancer cell, which is actually glioblastoma cell. It is actually one of the most dangerous brain cells in the society today. And from our literature search, we realize once one is infected, one has a problem with this glioblastoma cell, they usually have about roughly 18 months to survive it. So that was why sometimes they, all, they encourage higher dose in order for it to be killed. So for what we have here on our left hand here, so like I said earlier on, we, exp we pre incubated the cells with about, with a maximum of 100 micrograms per meal of the extract. So we now expose them to different grades of radiation. This is just a summary. This, like I said, we did with the honey radiated cell with the radiation only. We assume that at zero extract and zero radiation gray, we have all the cells intact, but practically not all the cells will survive due to some physiological problem. Some cells will die, some then will come in, but we normalize all our experiments to 100. That's 100% 100 viability <clears throat> that we have here. So for this experiment, what we actually did was when we realized that we're having low measurements for some of the cells, we actually adjusted the number of cells, although that was not shown in this slide. Before we did all this, we carried out the minimum number of cells that we need for each of these experiments. So that is what we did. But we realized these burn cells actually grow faster than this U87 cancer cell. So what we did was to independently examine the two cells. So for this cancer cell, we realized again <clears throat> that if we increase the extra concentration, we're able to get increased viability even after exposing them to radiation, which means after, if you incubate the cells with this extract, then there'll be more cells that will survive when you compare that to lower concentration of the extract. Also, we're able to realize the same thing with the bend cell, which is the normal cell, especially at two, four, six, and eight grades. Although for the cancer cells, the radiation, the after pre-incubating them with the extract, the effect of radiation we realized was not that dose dependent. So the only slight, but for the burn cell, we're able to realize that more of the cells survive at lower radiation dose, which goes in cognizance to what we have when we expose them only to CO2 source. So also we, for generally for the experiment, we realized that when we increase the concentration of the extract, there is a tendency that more of the cells will survive the amounts of radiation. Also for this experiment, we realized the same thing actually happens, which means the extracts we use actually has some form of antioxidant properties, which means it's, is able to reduce the amount of oxidative stress that is produced from this CO2, uh, sorry, from this cobalt 60 source. So this is just the general biology experiment that we carried out. Also for the ROS experiment, like I said earlier on, we use a plate feeder. Again, we use a flow cytometry, cytometry method because the dye that we use were very small in quantity. So we're able to understand if the dye actually works or not. So the experiment was actually first analyzed using eight gray, because like I said earlier on, once you expose a cell to radiation, ROS will be produced. And that was what we use this flow cytometer to examine. And these are cells we actually 
gated this, we looked at where more of the cells are for us to be able to get the mean value for the number of cells. So this is this also are cells. We use the p-high to know the amount of cells that are still living. And that is what we're able to get here. This is also a representation of this, but in another format. So we use this. This is just a brief summary for the cancer cell and also for the normal cells, we also did the same thing. So the useful part of this that I'm showing you is just we need the mean value here. That's the average value, the mean number of cells that remains after exposure to radiation. So from what we have here, I'm going to show you this on my right hand, right hand side first. From this experiment, we realized that exposure of the cancer cell to radiation actually produced more of the hard OS. So this indicates from zero grade to about eight gray, more of ROS was produced in the cancer cells than the normal cell line. But when we pre-incubated the cells with the extra that we used for this study, we realized that the amounts of ROS actually reduced, which actually supports- so what is the ROS again? Could you- ROS is the reactive oxygen species. When you, don't forget, I showed you a table, I showed you a curve earlier on here. Okay, this, that, since we are using a cobalt 60 source, it is going to follow an indirect action. The cells actually has 70% 70, 70 water content. And once radiation interacts with the water content, it will give excitation and then thereafter cause ionization of this water, which is what you have here. So this actually will recombine to give what we have here. So these are actually functions of the reactive oxygen species which means the higher the radiation dose that you have here, the higher these that are going to be produced. And once these, are going to, once these um, free radicals are high, then there is a higher tendency that the DNA will be damaged. So that is what I have in this study that I showed you here, which means as radiation dose increase, we have increased in the percentage of the amount of reactive, reactive oxygen species, which as a function of that, we measure the fluorescence in the cells. Like I said earlier on, the U87, the cancer cells, produce more of the reactive oxygen species, which means <clears throat> there is going to be more damage. But unfortunately, from our results, we're from, even from literature, we realize that these cancer cells are very, very stubborn, which means even with this high amount of ROS that are being produced, they, are still, they have some form of glioma in them, which makes them to be more resistive to the ROS. But what we are going to have is more of the damages to be formed through the viability, which means there are other inherent properties through which radiation can damage the cell outside the hard rays that we have here, which we also see here. You can see that even after we incubated the cells with the extract, more of the cancer cells still survived. But as the concentration of the extract increased, more of the cells actually die, but for a comparative study, we have more of the burn cells that produce less of what we have, which means if we're able to use this extract, more of the normal cells will be protected. And then this actually is going to be more affected by what we have here. So I actually used this also to look at the fluorescence at a very high radiation dose we used for the experiments. So for further studies, we examined these two 
reduce uh, with these two extracts because we used it further to look at our indentation experiment. So we realized that the from what I have here, the higher the radiation dose, the higher the amount of arrowheads that we're able to produce, but at increased extract concentration, we're able to get a reduced amount of reactive, reactive oxygen species for the normal cells, which means the normal cells, normal brain cells will be protected from the damaging effects of the radiation. But for what we have here, we realize that the reduction for the cancer cell was actually very not that significant, but for what we have for the 25 microgram per meal for this study, we saw we realized a little bit increment, but at 50 microgram per meal, there was a little bit reduction in the amount of reactive oxygen species that we measured at this very high dose. And don't forget the sixth gray and eighth gray we use were just single dose exposure <clears throat> for this experiment. So this is also an implication that dealing with a glioblastoma cell, which is the U87 cell is very, very tedious. And then one of the things we need to look at is for us to be able to protect the normal cells while we try to selectively increase the radi radiation dose for the cancer cell line. So for our AFM indentation experiment, like I showed you earlier on here, as we are indenting this, as we carry that indentation experiment, we're able to see these images <clears throat> true for the AFM. So this represented the normal cell line and then the U87. And don't forget, I said earlier on that when we were growing the cells, this U87 grew faster than the cancer cell line. So that was why we were able to get more concentration of the burn cell line in this experiment than what we have for the AFM. Now what we have for the U87 cell line that we did. So for all this that I showed you earlier on, the results of what we have here for this indentation experiment is what I term as the false distance curve for this study. Like I said, I'll be showing you what we have here in my own results. So the final indentation experiment that we have here is here indicated, although we did different studies, but I will only be showing you the results of these radiation doses. So the indication of this curve is that from this right hand here, this is the distance. This is for moving towards zero means if I move from my right towards my left hand side, it means the cantilever is moving close to the sample. And once it is moving like this, the force that we have here, the interaction force is, like I said, indicate the interaction between the tip of the cantilever and the brain cells that we use. So once the, once the cantilever is being retracted back, that is when it will be moving back from this zero back to our four years. So for this zero, Sorry, I did not indicate the full details here. This zero, zero means zero gray and zero extract. So I used this as the baseline for this particular study. So these two means two gray and no extract at all. So this means two gray and then addition of 25 microgram. Like I said earlier on, I wanted to be able to compare what we obtained to the ROS result and the other results of this study. So the two major extract concentration we used for the indentation experiment were 25 and 50 microgram per meal. So from, we're able to extract the 
stiffness of the cell and the stiffness of the cell that we extracted was from the software that we used, which was what was able to perform this call for us. So the final result of this indentation experiment, sorry, the indentation of this experiment was we were able to get the Young's modulus. And we realized that as we increased the extract concentration, the stiffness of the cells also increased. Although this was not prominently shown in this curve that we have here, but the reason why I showed you this is just to see that as the cantilever moves very close to the sample, which is from my fourth here to zero, the negative here indicates that in the indentation, because once it gets to the tip of our cell, it is going to indent on the cell. And that is why we have this negative sign here. So when we, able to, when we extracted our result from the software, we realized that once the extra concentration is increased, there is increased in the Young's modulus. And from literature, the Young's modulus in the, is an indication of the stiffness of the cells, which means the stiffer the cells, there is less, than, less tendency for the cells to move to neighboring cells. Also, like I said earlier on, there is a little, at this two gray radiation that we use, there are differences here, but the differences were not that prior, were not that significant, they were not pronounced. So we tried to look at four gray radiation dose here. The same thing was actually realized from the software we got, sorry, excuse me. We realized that increase in this concentration actually increased the stiffness of the cell both for the normal cell and then for the cancer cell line, which means there is a probability that if the extract is used, the cancer cell line may not move to the neighboring cell, which means we can actually control metastasis of this particular cancer cell that we have here. Because like I said during the introduction of this experiment that we want to look at a way of reducing metastasis of cells because when we say something is metastasizing, um, that means it is moving. And when we say something is moving, that is where physics can actually come in. And a way of examining that in this experiment is to look at the stiffness of that particular cell. Like I said, once a, once a cell is stiff, it will be difficult to pass through the vessels of the blood, the vessels of the blood, which is an indication that we're able to get also from this experiment that we have here. So from our experiment, there are some summary that we, I can actually bring out from this. So from the beginning, like I said, I summarized all the experiments into four. And from what I showed you earlier on, the in vitro in inhibition of the extract varies as the concentration that we used. That is the ability of the cell, uh, the ability of the extract that we used before we introduced the cells increased. The inhibition ability increased as the concentration also increased. So also during this experiment, we realized that these U87 cells were more resistant to radiation than the normal cells that we used. Although when we used, when we introduced the extracts, there was more of this that died. So, which means although the, there are going to be cell deaths for this U87, but more still survived the radiation, even after we compared that to this bent cell that we have here. So for the stiffness of the cells also increase for this experiment as the extract concentration also increase. For the bent cell especially, we realize that the radiation induced stiffness changes. That is when we exposed them to different radiation, radiation doses, 
there were some changes in the ability of the cells to actually migrate, which although from this experiment was not a linear function of the radiation dose. So the further study that actually there are some lapses in this experiment, which I'm actually trying to look forward to in the future is that we, the whole of this experiment, like I said earlier on, the indentation experiments was actually carried out in here, which normally should have been done under a growth, under a growth, standard growth medium. So because of the constraints with the facility that I use, like I said, the atomic force microscope was meant for a material science experiment, but I actually used a rule of thumb, which says once the cell can be imaged using the AFM, that means they are still attached to the substrate. And once they are attached to the substrate, that means they are still alive. So that was what I based that research on. So for further studies, it is recommended that they should be carried out under normal CO2 and then the oxygen medium. So I'm also looking forward to carrying out stiffness and addition of malaria infected blood samples because I realized in this part of the world, we are more affected with malaria. In fact, we are more affected with uh, mosquito bites. So this, the basis of this experiment can also be used. And this is where physics can also come in to diagnose malaria problem and also we can also use the AFM to study erythrocyte from sickle cell patients. Now, don't forget, I said stiffness of the cell is what the AFM can also measure, although we have other things the AFM can do, but the stiffness is one of the problems that sickle cell patients have because they are, once they have crisis, their red blood cell will have difficulty passing through the blood vessel. So we can actually examine all the drugs that they use to treat cancer patients and then use the AFM to analyze such the efficacies of those drugs, which is where physics can actually come in to help in the diagnosis of sickle cell anemia. And also where I am looking in the future to be able to do biophysical characterization of different cancer biopsy tissue. Although I have a proposal already for this, which is actually I'm still looking for a lot of laboratories to collaborate with in order to make these further studies to be a success. So these are just few of the references that I used for this study and I indicated them in this presentation. Uh, I think finally my appreciation goes to all my supervisor, my supervisors in Nigeria and also Dr. Flavia, who is also who has decided to have, who attended this presentation. I actually thank her very much. Out of her busy schedule, she was able to look into my experiments, come into the lab, and then she was able to help me through. And my appreciation also goes to all the heads of the laboratories that I use, especially at Vets University in South Africa. The members of the laboratories also helped me a lot during the experiments. And my appreciation will not be that complete if I forget ASP, because I remembered when I was looking for my, I was looking for an AFM to work with. I couldn't get, I sent an email to ASP platform and then I had, I got a lot of responses from that. And then my appreciation goes very greatly to Professor Ketevi. I could remember when I couldn't get, easily get the AFM a statement he made was that I should make sure that I don't give up. And then that actually carried me through all my studies. Unfortunately for me, I was able to get a laboratory then thereafter getting an accommodation again, I went back to AF, um, ASP platform and then I got a lot of responses that helped me through. And also for my colleagues, especially here in Nigeria, they also helped me a lot as when I got into some 
administrative issues. So I will also say a big thank you to all my friends and everybody that's made this PhD program to be a success. And I want to say a big thank you to everybody. Thank you for your attention. And I hope you've been able to get a glimpse of what my research study was all about. So thank you everybody for listening. Um, thank you, Kayose, for this presentation. And it's very nice to see um, the different uh, uh, physics topics uh, uh, discussed here. Um, so I would like to invite questions. I just want to say that uh, in about eight minutes, I have to connect to another, another engagement. I would have liked to discuss this more. This is really uh, very nice. Um, so maybe before we get to the questions, I would like to acknowledge Professor Flavia here. Um, if she wants to, any, any message or anything she wants to say, uh, then uh, please, uh, uh, she may go ahead. Well, I just like to congratulate Coyote and finally seeing the end of this road. I know it has been a very long journey for him. So um, yeah, just to be here and to listen to his work, um, I just want to let him know I'm very proud of his work and the journey that he's had from start to finish. Well done, Coyote. Thank you very much, thank you. Great, uh, thank you. Um, other people have questions or comments? Any follow-up questions, please? Uh, Sumialo, please go ahead. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, Kayedi, thank you for your nice presentation. And uh, yeah, uh, I really enjoyed it. I just wanted to understand uh, a little bit the way you measured uh, the young modulus when you increase the concentration. Why do we have the increasing of young modulus when you go to negative uh, concentrations? Are you talking about this? Yes. No, this is just the first, this is first interaction between the tip and the sump and the brain cells. The negative aspect there means it is moving close to inside the sample. Let me show you what I have here. So from the tip here to the top of this sample, that is where the positive aspect comes in. So once it starts to move inside the sample here, that is when we are going to have a negative. From what I have here, I have my D to be equal to what we have here, which means there is going to be a negative indentation, which is going to move inside this particular sample. So whenever you see, sorry, as you move from here, this is from the rest position, moving to the top of the sample. So as you move into this negative sign here, that means it is moving, the tip of the cantilever is moving inside the sample. So this does not represent the extract concentration. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, this is just the distance. Okay. As you can see what we have here, this is the distance. This is a negative distance. Okay, okay. Down. Yeah. All right, yeah. Okay, thanks. Other questions or other comments? Um, Kayode, you said that you use Cobalt City and uh, Cobalt City has uh, two uh, emission of two gamma rays. Um, does your result depends on, on the one that is absorbed or how does it depend on it? Or are you able to separate them here? Could you no, we did, not, yeah. we did not separate them at all. We only measured the amounts of radiation coming from here, not the energy of the radiation. The radiation does. So basically the two photon, the two gamma rays from the, from the cobalt system are essentially just used. Yes, yes, yes. Now, I, the other question that I have there is that, are they, did you explore using other sources? Does, does, you know, I mean, for example, the gamma rays uh, from cobalt system, we know 
Um, it's 1.33 MeV and 1.17 or something like that. But did you have, did you explore other sources with different, um, um, uh, of, uh, different photons? Uh, no, we only used the facility that was available for us. But could you comment on how your results might change if you use a different source of uh, gammas? Um, I don't expect there to be any major changes since uh, all the sources were, what we need from all those sources are just the radiation dose. That is mm -hmm. the amount of radiation coming into the substance, not the uh, energy actually. We only need the dose. So I don't expect there to be any major differences. The only differences that will be there will be the mode of production. Okay. Um, so what would you say, you know, where systematic uncertainty is here? Is that, you know, maybe noise level in the detector or the measurement itself? Does it have any any, any uncertainties or uh, the method of measurement? You, you use the model. Um, yeah, is that the only model I don't you use? Understand. Oh, okay. You use the model for um, when you have the the AFM. Uh, yes, yeah. um, you use a particular model here. Is that a conventional one or different models can be used? Or could you comment on how the result might be model dependent? Yeah, we have different models that can be used, but this is the simplest one. And then the basic idea behind this is that the sample behave like an elastic substance. So that was why we used this model. We have other recent models, but this is actually easier to use because I'm actually new to AFM. So I add short things with it. So that was why I decided to use this. I've not tried other models with it at all. Yeah, okay. I was talking about other uncertainties, like er sources of errors in your measurement. Could you comment on where those errors might come from and how do they affect the result? Yes, the sources of errors that I have, like I said, for my further studies, normally, I should not have imaged them in here because there may be some form of contamination on the cell. So that is one source of error that I can think of now from this experiment. Because although I wasn't the one that calibrated the AFM, so it is just an open facility for everybody to come in and use. So I don't know the problem that may be with the facility there, but the major error that can come in is air contamination. Okay. So Mialo, do you have uh, still another question or is that the previous I one? hope I answered your question, please. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Thank you, uh, Kayode. Uh, so Mialo, do you yes, have another question? No, it is fine. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Just as well to thank you, Kayode. I think it was very, very clear presentation and all the different methods as well. So you were using three of them with the AFM, as you said, it was uh, certainly the most precise one. So it means that now with the error that you have, the error is, is quite good as well. So you manage to, to limit uh, the... Yes, the others are also good. I will also look at them in the future, but the issue is getting the facilities again. And then maybe I will have to use the result I have to Indeed, because that, that's, models, yeah. that's quite important indeed for the radiation doses as well. So indeed, that's uh, that's good. You have maximum as well for the concentration of 100 uh, milligrams. So now as well with neutrons or with different uh, uh, sources, or, or did you look also for application? So you, you spoke about the malaria or are there any additional places or, or, or useful um, work as well that could uh, decay from uh, from this uh, result. Yeah, we can see in this experiment I use a photon source, so I'm also looking maybe if I can get neutron and then 
um, charge particle sources, examine that, examine them on the samples that I used and also on how what I have here, I think it will be very nice. But unfortunately, we don't have the facilities here. Yeah, so I remember we did want to bring you to BNL to use uh, our AFM here, but uh, there are some com there were some complications and but I hope that uh, you will visit our laboratory here and uh, do some experiment either our at, uh, with our biology department or Center for Functional Nanomaterial where we do have an AFM. Um, so we will uh, we will continue to explore that. At least uh, you should come for a visit. Uh, we'll see how that will work out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, but uh, congratulations uh, uh, to you. I'm really pleased to see uh, more and more of our alumni of the African School of Physics uh, finishing the PhDs in various areas with uh, quality research in different uh, type of uh, physics. Uh, it's very uh, enriching and illuminating. I'm very happy to hear this presentation. I'm not a biophysicist, uh, but it's refreshing to hear different type of physics. And that's that's very nice. Thank you very much. Um, okay, um, we will hear from Sumialo from two weeks, another biophysicist, and that will be very interesting as well, Sumialo. Uh, looking forward to hear your presentation as well. Um, okay. So, yeah. So, um, any person with any comments or anything else to add? Okay, Kayode, please uh, email me your, your slides. Uh, we're gonna okay. put that today on the agenda. Um, so for the people who are available, uh, still available here, let's just take a picture. Could you stop sharing your slides, Kayode? Mm -hmm. I mean, the screenshots and... Uh, uh, Munia, are you there? Could you um, take the screenshots? So people who wants to... Okay, okay, sure. Take, yeah. People who want to open up the cameras, uh, please do, um, so that we can capture this historical moment. Can you do your slides are still up? Could you stop sharing? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so. Okay. So I am ready. So Monia, please go ahead. Fine, thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, thanks everybody. Thank Kayode for this nice presentation. Dr. Uh, 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 Flavia, thank you uh, for being with us. And thank you for um, uh, mentoring uh, Kayode to uh, a successful uh, uh, a PhD. Okay, so everyone uh, um, who adjourn now and uh, see you next week. Christine, see you next week. Yeah, I see you soon. So until we, we finish the end, we follow up as well, Kayode. So I will answer more questions. But this is really good. Everything is recorded now. So we can get more information. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.